Hello all and welcome back. In this next video, we're going to talk about movements of synovial joints. So by the end of this, I'd like you to be able to define the three types of movements, describe the six types of synovial joints and the movements available at each, define range of motion, and describe factors that can change range of motion. So there are many types of synovial joints and the structure of each allow for different type of and range of movement. So first I want to introduce you to those three types of movements. The first is angulation. Now angulation means that the angle between the two bones that are moving is changing. So here you can see me in that lower corner bending my elbow or flexing at my elbow, and you can see that angle goes from 180 degrees of a straight line to less than 90 as I fully bend. So rotation refers to a long bones axis. So here you can see an example of rotation at the shoulder. Now the last type of movement is much subtler. So gliding movements. If one bone is gliding on another, it might not be readily apparent. So this will take place in the wrist, like we see here, or in the ankle. Now we're gonna go through the types of synovial joints and which movement is available at each. Remember these terms of movement will always be described based on anatomical position. So let's take a pause and remember anatomical position. What are the five things? Body, upright. Where are the arms? By the sides. How about palms? Palms face forward. How about toes? Toes are also forward. And then the last one, eyes forward as well. So essentially the way that this person is standing here in anatomical position. The first least mobile synovial joint is a plane joint. So this is where two flat surfaces like we see here and here are rubbing up against one another and they don't produce significant movement but there is some gliding between the surfaces. So here we see a couple examples of where we find plane joints and we'll talk more about those as we get into the regional anatomy. So the next joint is a pivot joint. Now did any of you grow up with a skip it? Potentially, you know what I'm talking about. Either way, it's when you put this loop, plastic loop around your foot, and then there's a long plastic kind of string attached to it. So this part goes around your foot, there's a long string, and there's this kind of heavy part on the other side. So your foot is in here, right? If that makes sense. And then you swing that, skip it around, and then you jump over it with the other foot. Super fun, right? Um, so you can think of the ankle here as the round bone and the skip it ring here as sort of this ring around either formed by a combination of ligaments or bone. So we see in the elbow that right there is a ligament forming a ring around the round portion of the radius here and then that movement will be able to take place. So this joint here, the elbow between the radius and that ligament, allows for what I was talking about earlier with the palms flipping up and pointing down toward the ground, which is called pronation and supination, something we'll see in the upper limb. And we have a similar configuration in the head, allowing us to shake our head no. Now a hinge joint brings us to our first joint that performs angulation. So remember this is a change in angle. So a hinge, like a hinge on a door, 
functions in only one direction. You can only open the door and then close the door. So the knee is a great example of this and can accomplish flexion and extension. So flexion and extension are actions that take place in the sagittal plane. So remember the sagittal plane is one that's cutting the body into right and left halves. So let's look at the elbow or at the knee. We see, you know, about 180 here. We can get up to 90 and we can get less than 90. So bending the knee is about the same thing. We've got this straight line here, which then can turn into about a 90 degree angle. So that decrease in angle from 180 to 90 is called flexion. So if we straighten back out, move toward anatomical position, this is known as extension. You can kind of think of this similarly here on the head. We see the angle moves this away. So within the ankle, these movements are very similar, but they have different names. Um, dorsiflexion is when we see those toes point up toward the ceiling, like as if you're about to take a step. And then plantar flexion is if you're pushing forward and pointing down toward the ground. Or you can think of a ballerina's feet being pointed, it would be plantar flexion. Now certain joints allow for extension beyond the return to anatomical position. Now most of us aren't able to hyperextend at the elbow. When we straighten out, it kind of has an end to it, but we can hyperextend at the shoulder. So we see that at this point, it would be called extension. And then as we go behind the body, that is called hyperextension. The next type of joint is a condylar joint. Here, a rounded portion sits on a rounded depression. So these joints allow for flexion and extension, but the structure of the joint can accomplish a new dimension of movement, abduction and adduction. An example of this is at the wrist. So abduction and adduction, sometimes you'll hear someone say, a B duction and A D duction to really draw emphasis to which one they're talking about since they sound so similar. But these actions are happening in a frontal plane, and you'll remember that plane cuts the body into anterior and posterior portions. So for abduction, think of your arm being abducted away, and this, as it moves up and over, will go eventually above your head. Now this is a more obvious motion at the shoulder, but it also happens at the wrist. So if you're able to kind of move your wrist just a little bit toward the outside here, that's abduction away. Now adduction adds back to the body. So you bring it back to anatomical position, more toward the body. I'll note in the hand and the foot, rather than talking about the midline like this for away and toward, in the hand and the foot, we're talking about the midline of the hand for away and toward. Now a saddle joint is named for how it resembles a sa saddle in a rider. Now this joint has similar mobility to a condylar joint, allowing for flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. We'll talk about this a lot when we get to the upper limb, but there's a little bit of a difference in the plane that we see flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction of the thumb but the thumb is an example of a saddle joint. Now, as an addition, any joint that can perform all four of these angular movements, so flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction, can also circumduct. 
So this is a complex of four motions, and you can see you have it here initiated with flexion, brought away from the body with abduction, back to the body with extension, and back to the midline with adduction. So this allows for the distal end to move in a circle. So far, the condylar and saddle joints allow all four motions and can circumduct. And here you see an example of circumduction at the finger. So the last synovial joint is the ball and socket, such as the hip or the shoulder. Ball and socket joints do all four angular movements, so flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. So what else can ball and socket joints do? Circumduction. Now we're adding in a new dimension of movement, which is rotation. And this rotation is along the long axis of a bone. So these ball and socket joints are the most mobile in the body, and therefore the least stable. This rotation on the long axis of a bone, we'll take for instance the humerus here on the right image, is called either lateral or medial rotation. For lateral rotation, it's rotating away from the body. It's also called external rotation. We can see in this image on the left, if you bend the elbow, you can see really how that's moving away. Then medial rotation is bringing it back toward the body. So in the image on the left, we see with the bent elbow bringing back toward the midline. Now beyond these movements, there are so many more that are named, and I'm going to give you a few of them to get us started before we start talking about specific joints that do these movements. So the first one is called lateral bending, or lateral flexion, and this is specific to the vertebral column. So you can imagine the vertebral column is just ever so slightly bent toward the side. And this action takes place within that coronal plane or the frontal plane. So our next two sets of movements concern both the scapula and the mandible, which are two quite odd complexes of joints. So both can elevate or move upward or depress, moving downward. And I noted down here, there is a difference in color on purpose. All of the darker colors of these arrows refer to away from anatomical position, and those that are lighter go to toward. So in anatomical position, your shoulders are depressed, but your mandible is elevated or closed. So elevation and depression are just opening and closing of the mouth, whereas elevation and depression of the scapula is like shrugging your shoulders. Now both of these can also protract, also known as protrusion, or retract. And these will then move forward and backwards along kind of a more horizontal plane. So you can see that movement here and that movement here. We'll come across more special movements, but we'll define them as we go. And we will most definitely redefine these movements, but having some basis for this terminology will be extremely helpful for you as you go forward into regional anatomy. Now range of motion is measured in angles. So like we were doing with the elbow, we can see down in anatomical position, it's at 180, and we can bend it up to 90 or more. So many different factors can affect this range of motion. And so I want you to brainstorm some factors that may increase or decrease range of motion. So pause the video so you have a second to write down some things you may think of. So let's talk about some of these. 
So the actual structure of a joint may allow or limit movement. So structure can go into both. Now this includes bones, ligaments, and muscles involved. So tighter or looser muscles or ligaments can affect the range of motion. So what about if you think about trying to put your foot toward your face? Other than flexibility, what's holding us back? So our bellies, for sure. So one thing that can decrease range of motion is the presence of soft tissue. It gets in the way. Something that may increase range of motion are hormones. So like during pregnancy, relaxin can lead to laxity or looseness of these ligaments, giving more mobility. Now disuse can definitely change our range of motion. If you stretch something specific every single day, that will increase the range of motion. If you don't use it, it will not. So there are many other factors you possibly came up with. You can always throw them out on Piazza if you want to. Um, but for now, I want a big thing I want you to take away here, again, is to remember that with increased mobility, we see decreased stability. Awesome. So let's do another question. So let's take a hypothetical situation. While you're listening to this video, you reach for a bottle of water. So when your fingers close around the bottle, what action is taking place? Is it abduction? adduction, extension, or flexion. So pause so you can remember these actions and then make your choice. All right, so let's talk about what the hand is doing. So the fingers come toward the palm. If we go back to anatomical position, the palms are forward, so the fingers would be coming away from the body in a sagittal plane. So what type of movement is that? So that movement is flexion. So if you straighten your fingers back out, that is extension. Now abduction is when the fingers are spreading out really wide, whereas adduction brings them close together. Great, so thank you for your attention during this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.